Hi, I'm Jared Brennan, and I'm an Identity Strategy and Solutions Advisor with SalePoint. Today, I wanted to share with you some guidance from my own experience on developing your identity strategy, ways to improve your identity program over time. Let's start, though, with a quick throwback. Do you remember any of these technologies? I actually owned two of them, the iPhone 3GS and the Linksys WRT54G router. Um, I have to admit, I have never used an Osborne one, but I know people who have. Uh, and I share these because they were all very disruptive technologies. They fundamentally changed how we did our jobs with computers. We went from workstations that were hardwired and bound to our desks to having some mobility with a fairly bulky laptop, although I'm sure your laptop is uh, much, much lighter than the original Osborne. Uh, and we do that over wireless networks. We don't have to be tethered to our desks anymore. We don't even have to be in the office. We could be sitting at a coffee shop. We could be at home on a tablet, on a smartphone, doing the same things we would do uh, at our traditional jobs. And if we're working in technology, we come to accept that change as the norm. There's always something new on the horizon. Uh, there's always something new coming that we need to be prepared to both embrace and to secure. Identity is no exception, not a technology on its own per se, but in my background, identity always had a, a security value within that technology space. If you got the usernames and passwords and multi-factor tokens right, you could reduce the risk of attacks internally and externally, and you could demonstrate compliance to the auditors each time they came up. A trend that we're seeing now, though, is that identity has strategic business value. If you're better at automating, giving people access to things they need in order to do their jobs, if you're embracing this notion of identity and going out to consumers and looking at uh, technologies like artificial intelligence, you're going to have a competitive advantage over other people in the same industry. And because of that, uh, this value behind identity requires people like you and me to figure out how to be strategic in some of the changes we make. Thinking strategically uh, sounds easy. And there was an article a few years back from uh, Harvard Business Review that uh, raised some very specific questions you could ask if you wanted to approach strategic thinking. Uh, what I wanted to do today is give you another set of questions that you can apply to your own thinking toward your identity program to help you start to approach that program strategically. The very first question is pretty blunt. What's your identity strategy? And I, I say that knowing full well that you've got plans for what you wanna do maybe next year, if not for the next couple of years. But I wanna step back and approach that question from the basics, from the 101 fundamentals. Like, for example, when we say identity program, what do we even mean? Traditionally, back when I was running an identity program, I called it identity and access management. And that was actually the combination of two separate disciplines, identity management, right? Creating accounts for individuals, flesh and blood people, and then access management, granting those accounts the ability to do things in different systems and applications. And that didn't always include privilege management. It should have, but it didn't. Looking at people who had higher levels of, of privilege than the traditional end user. But when we talk about identity governance and administration, we're talking about an umbrella that covers all three of those practices. And you can really simplify it with people needing accesses to resources in order to do their jobs. Now, in my space, I tend to think of identity governance as a life cycle. It doesn't necessarily have a beginning, middle, and end, although that cyclical nature does have some of, of that to it. Um, but with an identity, there's a, a joiner event, a mover event, and a lever event that you should begin to consider. A, a joiner event is when someone, again, flesh and blood, uh, comes into a, a new relationship with your organization. Now that could be a new hire for an employee. It could be a new student if you're in higher ed. It could be a new volunteer. It could be an intern. There's a contractor consultant. There's so many different joiner events that initiate the beginning of that relationship where 
an identity now means access to things. And once you've got that identity established over time, what that identity needs access to is likely to change. We call these mover events. A mover event could be uh, someone going on maternity leave or paternity leave or short-term disability sabbatical, um, where they don't need access to everything that they had access to yesterday, but it might just be temporary. It might be short-term. And at some point, it's likely that that identity uh, is not going to need access to anything. That's a relationship with your organization will end. We call that a lever event. And that's when you start turning things off and then keeping things around long enough to meet compliance and legal requirements before you delete them entirely. Those three events comprise the entire identity governance life cycle. A lot of complexity beneath them, but think of it in, in those terms. As you're looking at your program, you're going to want to look for a, a balance between tactical activities and strategic activities. When I say tactical, I mean near-term quick wins that run the risk of keeping everybody busy without changing things. Just think of how many people manually create accounts and reset passwords in your organization. Maybe not on-prem, but even in some of the software as a service apps. Um, doing that day in, day out doesn't bring value to the business, but it keeps people busy. And unless there's an impetus to change, they may not change. Strategic thinking, that long-term continuous improvement is, is where we get that impetus for change. But if you spend all your time thinking about what you're going to do and you don't actually do it, nothing changes, right? You've got to have a good balance between tactics and strategy. Tactical identity initiatives include things like birthright provisioning, right? If somebody shows up on day one, how do you get them access to what they need? The things that are going to enable them to do what they were hired to do. Uh, same token offboarding. When someone leaves the organization, how do you make sure you shut off the accounts and all the systems that were connected? And then password resets. Over time, if we're requiring people to update their passwords and they forget it or they type it in, uh, differently than they remember. Um, there, there's some activity there around uh, tactical value, right? Where you can automate some of it. So you can put specific things in place that will alleviate the work. But that's just tactical. When I'm talking strategic, I'm talking about things like widespread role-based and attribute-based access controls. Automating the separation of duties controls where you identify toxic combinations, things that people should not have access to um, at risk of committing fraud or accidentally breaking something. Uh, Non-employee identity governance, uh, bringing into your identity program those uh, accounts belonging to identities that don't come from the human resources system. And then integrating identity systems with other technologies, right? You've got big data, right? You've got some data scientists looking at all the information that they're collecting from your outward facing applications. Is there something they could be doing there with your identity that would provide value to the business? Again, strategic plans are a little different than tactical initiatives. So as you ask yourself about identity strategy, you can drill down into a more specific question. What's your on-prem identity strategy? Now this is where our identity programs have grown up, right? We had manual processes that lived in systems and LDAP directories on-prem that we may have added some automation to, whether it came from the vendor or whether we did it with uh, very small shell scripts, PowerShell scripts, and it traditionally focused on employees and contractors. Now, this might be your current state today, and that's cool. I mean, that's where everyone's identity program grew up. Uh, and if you want to get a better understanding of how to take some of that activity down a strategic improvement path, then the first thing you should do is take inventory. Start with directories. This is where all those accounts are going to live, the accounts that map back to the identities. You want to look for the uh, usernames, right, and what they have access to. But at a minimum, you need to know what these directories are. Then you can start mapping the directories to specific systems and applications. Do people log into your line of business app through Active Directory, or is it a local user store that only lives within that application? Uh, 
step back from the technology and take a look at your policies, procedures, and standards. At some point, somebody wrote things down about your organization, about how you were going to do the things that your organization does. And they did it within the context of the level of excellence that they want you to bring to those practices. Do any of these identity systems deviate from your policies and procedures and standards? That's on you to figure out. And then while you're digging into those documents, uh, figure out who wrote them, right? You've got stakeholders all over the organization who chimed in and said, this is the way we're gonna do what we do. Talk to these folks. They're, they're probably on a steering committee like a security steering committee or risk steering committee, but as part of your inventory, you're not just looking at the technology, you're also gonna be looking at the people. And then you want to assess your technical debt. We've all got it, right? Systems and applications that became too critical to upgrade, to change, to ever walk away from. And you need to ask yourself, you know, what, what do we owe? Where are we relying on technology that might present more a risk to the organization? Uh, who are the stakeholders around those technologies, right? The, the end users, the directors, the VPs, uh, the sysadmins, right? The app admins, the people who keep that technology up and running. And once you understand what your technical debt is, step back and ask yourself, what's the best way for me to engage leadership for a conversation about this debt? Chances are they're already having a conversation. And frankly, if you've got a responsibility around identity at your company, you should be at the table. Uh, engaging them could be joining one of these meetings, jumping on a conference call. Uh, it could also be grabbing a coffee when the time is right, going out to lunch and just having an informal conversation. And one of your goals in engaging leadership is you want to come away with an understanding of what they're willing to invest to pay off that debt. They may have other competing initiatives that are going to bump up against your identity program improvements. And you need to understand uh, what their take is, what their uh, stance is on where they need to be investing the money that they have in their budgets. At the same time, step back and take a look at your organization and look at how you do what you do. Your organization has grown up over time and there's a good chance that even though their core mission may have stayed the same, that some of their business practices may have changed with the times. Uh, most every organization I speak with is looking at cost optimization, right? How do we do what we do, but do it for less, right? Spend less time and money on the things that don't provide value while focusing on the things that provide value to our users and our customers. Um, a number of organizations, yours might be no exception, have going through uh, an M&A process where they have either joined forces with another company or they've divested certain parts of the business to go operate on uh, on their own. Understanding how your company uh, does M&A is going to give you an insight into how they operate from a business level. And they also may be considering expansion into new markets and new regions. I was working at a very popular retailer a number of years ago uh, based in the U.S. and they decided to expand globally. That fundamentally changed how we did what we did. And you better believe my identity program was right at the core of that. Uh, if you don't know who to talk to, but your company is publicly traded, you can go out to the SEC's website and go to the Edgar tool, download your company's 10K report, and read the same information they're providing to investors. It's a pretty clear roadmap of what they want to accomplish, and it's going to be very insightful in helping you improve the identity program. In addition to the on-prem identity strategy, you need to be asking about the cloud identity strategy. I remember a time where as a service just wasn't a thing. We did everything in the computers that lived in our data centers. and We didn't do anything outside of those systems. Now there are organizations, new businesses that start with this notion of no spinning platters. They don't want any infrastructure because they want to be laser focused on what they're in business to do. And they see the services that enable them to do that business as someone else's responsibility. So what's your current software as a service footprint? Where are you using websites that people at your company log into in order to do their jobs, in order to meet your customers' needs? In addition to software as a service, you should also look at platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. By platform, I mean things like Workday and Salesforce and Splunk and 
these technologies that are so much more than a single use piece of software. And infrastructure as a service will be your big cloud service providers, your AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, OpenStack, Alibaba. They, there's a laundry list of, of these organizations and you need to know which ones are in play at your organization in order to bring them into your identity governance program. Are you a cloud first organization? If a new project were to cross your plate today, would you be given the instructions, go find a service provider who does this? And then if you can't find one, we'll build it ourselves. Because if, you, if that's what leadership is telling you, then you're cloud first. And are you a multi-cloud organization? Chances are, yeah. There are a lot of organizations who use AWS and Azure for a number of reasons. Google is rising in popularity. They've got a huge footprint. And the other two I mentioned, Open, OpenStack and Alibaba, uh, have use all over the world. Um, it's rare to find an organization that's uh, single cloud today. And in the next few years, I think that number is going to be even smaller. So ask yourself these questions about your own organization within the context of the AWS shared responsibility model. Even if you're not using AWS at all, this model is tremendously helpful in understanding what you are responsible for versus what the cloud service provider is responsible for. AWS has done a terrific job of articulating what you can change and modify and touch and what you're on the hook for in terms of management and security and drawing the, the comparison to the things that their staff are responsible for. They keep it fairly general, so there may be some nuances at the other cloud service providers you work with, but I have a hunch that if you take a, a closer look, you'll see that they, uh, they hold true. They, they are pretty much the same. So a few questions to ask yourself about your cloud strategy. Are your identity policies, procedures, and standards cloud ready? Your data classification policy, change control, application security policy, identity and access management policy, they were probably written for on-prem solutions and there may be language in there that doesn't translate to the cloud. There may be things that you say you own from a policy perspective that in a shared responsibility model you don't. So you need to go back and review those policies. You should also ask about training. Don't assume that just because somebody understands how to use a technology on-prem that that knowledge transfer is gonna be one-to-one -one when you go to the cloud. It's not. There are differences there that need to be accounted for. And if you're not training your people on how to adjust to those differences, you're doing yourself a disservice. Take a look at where your cloud services overlap. There may be opportunities for consolidation, again, part of that cost optimization activity, to pull back on who has access to what. And then ask yourself, how do you determine which as a service is a good fit? Do you have guidelines that you can give to your users to say, yeah, if you're going to use something in the cloud, here's how you select the right one for the company. Here's who you engage and here's the criteria that these organizations have to meet before we can trust them. If that's not documented, you can't assume that people are following the same rules and guidelines that you follow yourself. Shift your attention for a second away from the cloud technology and the on-prem technology and look at the identity. I want to ask first, what's your non-employee identity strategy? We've been managing employee identities for years, but when it comes to non-employees, we're still trying to catch up. In a, a human sense, I'm talking about contractors, consultants, customers, volunteers, retirees, alumni. All these people who still need access to systems and applications, but they're not a traditional employee. They're not in the midst of that join or move or leave or life cycle. They're in a, a different state. And you also have to consider your non-human employees. System accounts and service accounts should be mapping back to somebody. Robotic process automation, if you're using RPA uh, accounts, then you need to consider who's governing those accounts is, you're giving those accounts privilege and, and authority. Uh, a step down the road from RPA, artificial intelligence, which has more autonomy even than RPA. Uh, all of that falls under this non-employee identity umbrella. And where do you find that information? There should be systems of record somewhere. Uh, your human capital management suite, your HR system is likely gonna have your employee data, may or may not have your contractor and consultant data. 
which by the way could also be in separate spreadsheets and databases or even a whole separate instance in your human capital management system. Customer information is likely going to be in application databases, maybe LDAP stores. In higher ed, there are dedicated systems like student information systems and alumni management systems that are designed for managing those identities. And then your non-human accounts, the ones that aren't local, are going to have a presence in LDAP directories and databases. And as you're looking at all these systems of opportunity, there's a good chance you're going to find opportunities to centralize some of this. So what questions should you be asking here? How do you define and classify each identity type? What's the difference between a contractor and a consultant, right? You want some specific details there. Which identity types will you govern in the next few years? Maybe you're not doing RPA today, but in two years, maybe, next year. Maybe you are doing RPA and, and you just don't know about it. Um, so you need to start looking ahead and, and again, draw from what you've learned about where the business is going. And then how do you govern identities for those non-employee humans? HR probably has a pretty significant stake in traditional employees, but do they have that same stake in non-employees? Uh, what about non-humans, right? Who governs these RPA accounts? Who governs service accounts, right? How do you govern? How do you make these decisions? There's a lot of activity that's going to come out of these four questions. And then what's your non-human identity strategy? And when I say non-human, I'm talking about the evolution of RPA accounts that have some limited autonomy to machine learning uh, accounts that are identities, especially in the unsupervised machine learning space, that are given a little more autonomy, right? Told to just go do a thing and come report back. All the way up to artificial intelligence, which may have some decision-making capabilities that extend beyond what you're granting to your RPA accounts. Um, going back to that RPA discussion, if you want to know whether or not you're using RPA accounts, ask around about these four vendors. Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, Nice, and UiPath, pretty popular and pretty well known in the RPA space. Not the definitive list, but if you hear anybody using any of these four vendors, then yeah, you, you've got RPA accounts somewhere in your organization. And as you look at artificial intelligence, you also need to step back and say, are we deploying this technology in a way that has greater value than risk? Or are we exposing ourselves to, to risk that we hadn't uh, previously been exposed to? Just like defenders are using artificial intelligence, so are attackers. And as AI continues to evolve in this space, it's going to do you good to stay ahead of those stories, stay in the know of how that technology is changing and how it maps back to the identities that that technology relies on to get access to the things it needs to do. And then what are some other factors that you should uh, be considering when it comes to your identity program? Things like timelines that are outside of your control. I know a lot of SAP shops right now who are suffering some heartburn from their technology debt as SAP has made a, a hard decision to say as of this date, everybody's got to be on this platform. And uh, if you've got relationships like that, uh, you need to be aware that you may be expected to make changes to your identity program and the timeline doesn't meet your, your budget and, and staff uh, if uh, an event like this happens. Now, fortunately, vendors this large will look ahead and make sure that they're not acting uh, too quickly, but it will take time to turn that ship and, and make changes that you need to make. You also need to consider uh, how your organization compares with the traditional waterfall method of project management and application development to the more agile mindset that we've come to call DevOps and DevSecOps, right? That notion of continuous deployment where you may have multiple deployments of uh, technology, of an application each week, something that lives outside of a traditional uh, ITIL change advisory board process. Um, as you start to embrace a DevOps mindset, that will impact how quickly things change and shift and move and could impact how quickly you need to grant access to people in order to be able to do their jobs. So look at in your own organization for how you're embracing DevOps to get a, a better picture of where you should be going. Outside of your organization, you want to look at legislation and 
legislation and regulation that might be impacting you either immediately or in the near term. Uh, when GDPR was first passed, uh, it first came on the books in uh, May of 2018, it made waves around the world. And then in the US uh, in January of 2020, when the California Consumer Privacy Act, we felt some of that same pain. Like, wow, now we need to make sure that people have right access to the right information because there's some pretty hefty fines if they don't and if somebody violates that. It's really difficult to stay on top of all the things you should comply with. Um, organizations like Unified Compliance Framework are making an effort to do just that, but you will need to spend some time figuring out what you're supposed to comply with, both from a security perspective and a, a privacy perspective, which raises the question, have you had an identity conversation with your chief privacy officer? If you don't have a chief privacy officer, then you might want to talk to someone in leadership because if GDPR or CCPA are uh, uh, regulations that you're bound to, you need to take action sooner rather than later. There's also this notion of bring your own identity, which just blows my mind. Um, if I look at the mobile space, uh, if I come into work and bring my own personal device and say, hey, put applications on this so I can do my job, we're still trying to figure that out as an industry. So what if a user shows up and says, hey, uh, I want to bring my own identity, not an Active Directory account, not a, a Google Cloud account. I'm talking an identity that's mine and that I control and I own. I need you to provision entitlements to that identity. We're just not ready for it, folks. And there are already global organizations talking about how to uh, make that change, how to make that commonplace across the, the world. And the other external factor I encourage you to consider is the, the rise of the cloud form, right? I mentioned earlier that some of these technologies like Workday and Salesforce and ServiceNow, they're robust. They're not just a one-trick pony. Uh, and as you've got more platforms that have complexities and have their own ecosystems and their own integrations, understanding how identity flows among those platforms it's going to put you in that position to bring strategic value to your organization, to mitigate the risks of overexposing or over entitling identities or, or the data those identities have access to, while at the same time enabling people to use these platforms in order to reap the benefits. Anytime I share information with an organization, uh, with an individual, I always want to spell out some things you can dig into after the fact. I just, the, the teacher in me finds that incredibly valuable. And the first thing I'd recommend for you is NIST Special Publication 863. It's actually four separate documents, definitely worth a read, all from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, designed to help you get an idea of what digital identity looks like and means to your organization. You should also do an identity program maturity assessment. Apply the traditional capability maturity model, the one, two, three, four, five, to questions around where you are today, where you want to be next year, and who the stakeholders are involved, all as it pertains to your identity controls. You can find those stakeholders on a steering committee, like an identity risk privacy steering committee, and you can also discuss with them the strategic goals that they want to set for the identity program. Uh, it could be things as simple as automating password resets all the way up to widespread role-based and attribute-based access controls. Uh, you want to talk to them about strategy and get their backing and their support. You'll also want to scope out some quick wins. This is uh, deriving tactical wins from your strategic plans, building an identity foundation uh, so that all of your applications tie into one repository, one warehouse where you can see who has access to and then growing that out over time and revealing who has access to these different sources, these different uh, applications, gets you to a point that you can automate birthright provisioning and then ultimately entitle, enable people to request access to things as they see fit, as their mover events happen and jobs change. Then you'll be at a point that you can look at role-based access controls and separation of duties. But take a measured approach to how you grow this out. Also, engage the community. The fact that you're here at the conference today means you're already one step ahead. 
I'd encourage you to look at the ID Pro body of knowledge, uh, vendor neutral community curated body of content around identity. Also, uh, the Identity Find Security Alliance as a framework. It is a terrific resource for people going through a program maturity assessment. And the Identiverse Conference uh, that happens each year. Uh, you, it, it's a mecca for all these discussions around identity. If you want to know what's on the horizon, that's where you're going to find it. Um, I have some resources here that I share at the end of the presentation. I'd encourage you to uh, reach out to me by email or here in the chat. Uh, I'm not a difficult person to find online, jared.brennan at salepoint.com. I also use LinkedIn pretty heavily, and I have a couple of other social media accounts that uh, you can reach me through. But if you'd like this information, if you want to discuss further, I would very much like to talk to you. But for now, thank you for your time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conversation.